It is the year 401 BCE. You're in the heart of Mesopotamia. You just won a battle against one of the greatest rulers of your time, but your supplies have been destroyed, your leader is killed, and you're suddenly elected to lead an army of roughly 10,000 Greek mercenaries back into Greek territory that is hundreds of miles away. What do you do? This is the very crappy, pun intended, situation in which Xenophon found himself after the Battle of Kunaxa. Battle in which the large force of Greek mercenaries managed to rout the Persians led by Artaxerxes II. Two times! And win the battle with only one recorded wounded soldier. Despite the impressive victory at Kunaxa, Cyrus the Younger, the employer of these 10,000 mercenaries, died while charging his brother in a bid to claim the Persian throne, rendering the victory utterly useless. Without a job, in hostile territory, no supplies and 10,000 mouths to feed, Xenophon and the 10,000 needed a miracle, but the miracle was Xenophon himself. I'm even dubbing Xenophon a honorary Portuguese and I bestow upon him the medal of the Order of the Bacalhau and the honorary member of Team Azate. And for you to be a part of Team Azate, all you have to do is subscribe to the channel and like this video like Xenophon would clearly do. The Great Retreat of the 10,000 starts after the betrayal of the Persian satrap Tisafernes, who after promising supplies to the Greeks in exchange for their retreat from Persian lands, lured the Greek army's commanders for peace talks and ambushed them instead. Now, this is what I call a huge turd, okay? After the death of the commanders, Xenophon is elected to lead the 10,000. Luckily, the Greeks had been allowed to resupply in the local markets before the betrayal, which was enough for them to promptly start their march north. The 10,000 were pursued by Persian horse skirmishers, slingers and archers on their way north, and every morning they'd be harassed with missiles. Xenophon and his captains devised a plan to deal with this. They organized new types of units and men on pack horses, and one day they waited for the Persians to strike, surprising them with a charge. This killed and wounded most of the Persian skirmishing force, which prompted Tisafernes to pursue with a large Persian force. This large Persian host was too great for the Greeks to fight, so they just kept marching forward. Looting any towns on their wake, they'd take any food and weapons they could get and burn everything else, assuring that their own needs were met as well as preventing the Persians from taking any supplies from these locations. This was a brilliant idea. It slowed down the Persians, but I am not too sure that the locals enjoyed it that much. Hmm. The large Persian force followed the Greeks who marched at night to make sure the Persians couldn't catch up. They were pursued all the way up to Corduen. At this point, they left Persian territory and Tisafernes refused to give chase. The Greeks thought it would be a peaceful march now that the Persians were gone, a nice hike over the Zagros mountains, a scenic route. The local peoples, the Cardukians, were fiercely independent and rebelled against the Persians frequently. Legends told that these peoples were undefeated in battle and that even the mighty and numerous Persians would not dare fight them. Due to the quarrels the Cardukians had with the Persians, Xenophon and his men thought that maybe, maybe, they'd be allowed to march through their lands. You know, after all, mutual enemies, so they must be friends, right? However, soon, the Greeks found out that at night, the beacons were lit. The beacons have been a city. The beacons are lit! Let's go kill some Greeks. And their forces were ambushed by small raiding parties through the narrow passes and valleys of the Zagros Mountains. The Cardukians were not playing, but this is, in my opinion, no way to treat a guest. The Greeks divided their army into smaller units that would march quicker to secure the mountain passes while the whole army passed through them and they marched from hilltop to hilltop. After several days, the 10,000 reached a defile where the main Cardukian force stood. After days of fighting off the ambushing parties, the Greeks were also able to make a few prisoners. One of them told them of a pass that would lead beyond the defile. Xenophon took 2,000 men through this pass under the cover of a rainstorm. On the next morning, the 2,000 men fell upon the Cardukian host, blowing their trumpets, alerting the main army of the start of the battle. The Cardukians were not expecting this attack on their flank. They were confused and as soon as the main Greek force charged, they routed their foe and the Cardukians left the field. After the encounter, the Greeks finally reached the Centrites River. 
However, the Kardukian regrouped host is at their backs, and the Armenian Persian satrap is on the opposing bank of the river. It's yet another crappy, again, pun intended, situation in which the Greek host is in great peril. Xenophon and his captain soon learned of another crossing and immediately diverted the whole army towards it, and both hostile forces mirrored this movement. Xenophon, however, decided to lead the rear guard of the 10,000 back to the first crossing prompting the Armenians to divert a large force back downriver, weakening the defense of the crossing upriver. Kairisophus, a Spartan in charge of the main force, took advantage of the Armenian movements crossing the river and overwhelming the Armenian defenses and also gaining a foothold on the far side of the river. Xenophon and his smaller force were still on the near side of the river and rushed back up to meet Kairasophus. At this point, the Kardukians attack, but the Greek discipline held and the tribes were routed, allowing Xenophon to finally cross the river. The Armenians backed off and offered the Greeks a truce. If they don't loot or pillage, they can take any supplies they need on their route north. Hmm, where have I heard this one before? Xenophon and his captains begrudgingly accept this truce due to their dire need of supplies. The Armenians shadowed the 10,000's movement and as such the suspecting Greeks sent out a spy who returned with a prisoner. The Armenians were, indeed, not trustworthy. They are plotting an ambush. <gasps> oh my, I was definitely not expecting this, said the Greeks. But the almighty Xenophon knew just what to do. He handpicked a select force and under the cover of darkness he launched a surprise attack on the Persian camp, sending the Persians into disarray, routing them and basking on their supplies. But the bigger threat wasn't the Armenians, it was rather the cold, harsh winter in the Armenian country. It was in Armenia that most of the casualties the 10,000 suffered got inflicted, and it was the elements that did it, killing close to a quarter of the Greek host. Men died to frostbite, starvation, some just sat on the roadside waiting to die, but most of them carried on. Upon leaving the Armenian hills, the 10,000 arrived at the coastal plains. This wasn't without peril, however, but there were no major events other than a few skirmishes with the local tribes. The final adventure recorded on the retreat from Persian territory is that of the capture of a hill fort. The Greeks, desperate for supplies, decided to raid the lightly defended structure. I'm honestly pretty sure that this is where dodgeball or maybe even guacamole were invented. Every time the Greeks moved forward, the defenders flung boulders at them, and the Greeks quickly retreated and moved out of the way. This is what is recorded. He did this so often that at last there was quite a heap of stones lying in front of him, but he himself was untouched. Then, the other men followed his example and made it a sort of a game, enjoying the sensation, pleasant alike to old and young, of courting danger for a moment and then quickly escaping it. After the defenders were almost out of boulders to throw at the Greeks, they stormed the structure, easily taking it and the supplies within. It was mere days later that they reached the shoreline and upon seeing the sea, the Greek mercenaries shouted Thassala, Thassala, meaning the sea, the sea. It was surely a great moment for them. See what I did there? They know they shall be home soon, no longer tied in enemy territory. They can wave the Persians goodbye. All right, all right, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll stop, don't be salty. <laughs> Whoopsie. The 10,000, now more like 7,500, finally reached Terpesus, a Greek conglomerate of colonies. Their journey didn't end there, but the hardest part was done, and Xenophon wrote the Anabasis, detailing the events I have shed light upon on this video. The importance of Xenophon's work and the sacrifice of these men was immeasurable, being one of Alexander the Great's influence in military tactics. Feints, flanks, mountain warfare, discipline and rearguard actions are some of the things that Xenophon's work came to introduce or revolutionize in warfare. While most of his military actions may seem trivial to us now, for him and his peers they represented thinking completely outside of the box. This was the epic retreat of Xenophon and the 10,000. I hope you enjoyed the video, do subscribe for more content and to of course join Team Azeite. Give me your loudest Portugal caralho in the comments below and I'll see you all on the next video. I'm in Portugal.